Welcome to the webinar hosted by Tower Cool Chain Solutions, titled What Innovations Has COVID-19 Created Within the Cool Chain Sector? Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. 안녕하세요. 니하오. I am Linda Kim from Cold Chain Platform. I am very excited you are joining us today from all over the world. It has been a very challenging year and the role of logistics is more important than ever. I believe you will have a great informative session today. As you can see, I am joined by four industry experts. Let me introduce speakers today. So, Michael Kumsimor, advisor at WHO. Michael has more than 35 years experience within the airline, freight, career, post and life science arena. Michael is supporting the WHO uh, in the Western Pacific region with a focus on emergency supply chain logistics strategies and ensuring that urgent vital medical supplies and diagnostic equipment are securely distributed to meet the COVID-19 response. Michael is joining us from Singapore. Good afternoon, Michael. Good afternoon, Linda. Thanks for inviting me. And uh, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Okay, next on the panel is Mike Mikin, Vice President, Global Quality Regulatory and Compliance at DHL Supply Chain. With over 23 years in pharma and 35 in logistics, Mike has incredible experience managing diverse multi-site, multi-activity, activity, customer operations in health, chemical, retail, and pharma markets in Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Mike was a key author in the production of DHL's Yellow Book, its GXP guidelines for biologics, medical device, and pharmaceuticals. Mike is joining us from the UK. Good morning, Mike. Yes, uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon to everybody on the call. And thanks for um, inviting me. Our pleasure. Next on the panel is Richard Dudbridge, Global Sales Manager at Tower Cold Chain Solutions. Richard has worked for Tower Cold Chain Solutions for over 15 years, working his way up to Global Sales Director. Richard has worked with many of the largest pharma and 3PL companies and has been instrumental in designing and developing the new deep frozen range of tower containers. Richard is also in the UK. Good morning, Richard. Good morning, good afternoon. Good evening to some, no doubt. <laughs> Thanks. Last on the panel, we have Mike Slaypan, director of value stream management at Janssen Pharma. Mike had 20 years of experience in supply chain and product management for vaccines, biologics, and small molecule pharmaceuticals with a special focus on life cycle management and Northeast Asian supply chain. Mike is joining us from Japan. Good evening, konbanwa, Mike. Hello, Linda. Thank you for having me. And um, hello to all the participants. Good morning. Good afternoon. I hope you have a good webinar. Thank you. Our uh, four speakers will share their experiences and insights and discuss what they and their companies have learned and what successful innovations they have implemented during the COVID-19 pandemic. Each speaker will give a 10 minute presentation and after each speaker's presentation, panel discussion will follow for five minutes. After our speaker's uh, presentation, we will have a Q&A session for about 30 minutes. So please submit your questions using the question box, a Q&A box throughout the webinar. 
So we will answer as many as we can at the end. So now let me introduce the first speaker, Michael Kumsimor, advisor at WHO. Michael will be discussing some of the challenges, trends, and innovations that the humanitarian and health sector based on the onset of COVID-19, together with the highlights of the planning for the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccines, specifically on the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, please welcome Michael. Thank you, Linda. Um, I really only have two slides, and of course, it's very difficult to put such a extraordinary and, and cumulative year into, into two slides, but I've divided it into um, what we, what we uh, experienced during the beginning of, of this and, um, and then what we're doing in terms of preparation. Um, these are my own personal thoughts. Um, they don't represent uh, the official position of the World Health Organization, so today I'm speaking as an individual. Um, Early days, I call it early days. So we all remember there was a scramble for PPE. Uh, there was massive uh, pricing hikes. Um, at the same time, almost 90% of the commercial aviation aircraft that we're used to using to get things between A and B dropped out of the skies. Um, there was nationalistic hoarding going on. There was a lot of barriers put in place uh, where countries were, were really looking after their own um, and there, there was also a rise of, of, of fake news that so people didn't really understand what's going on. Um, some of the solutions around this, I think each country has their own success story. Um, I think the industry reacted and adapted very, very quickly. I, I, when I look at the fashion industry, uh, they stopped manufacturing clothes. They started to manufacture PPE. Uh, we had a great example from Diaclon, the, the, the French sports company that, um, that, that sort of changed a snorkel mask into helping uh, put, put together in a ventilator. Um, so there was really a rally around innovation, I think, uh, that, that helped in the, early, in the early onset. And that still is, is going on. And some, some companies have actually refocused their, their business model around that. I think there was a refocus on purchasing locally. Um, I think that uh, buying everything from overseas and, and particularly the world was probably dominated by three countries in, in terms of suppliers. It was the US, China, and India. Um, and, and I think people realize that it's actually going to be better if we start diversing our, our procurement process, uh, buying from smaller countries, um, and, and indeed to start you know, manufacturing locally if, if, your, if your supply chain solution has, has disappeared because of lack of shipping and lack of aircraft, you really need to look to produce locally. I think we saw the airline industry respond very positively. Um, they, of course, suffered the most with not having any passengers to fly. There were thousands of aircraft parked in the desert. But what we did see is that some airlines responded positively and converted the passenger aircraft into freighters. Uh, you'll see there's a picture of literally boxes on seats. And they still uh, happen to continue today. And they're, they're very much part, I think, of the, of the prepared vaccine rollout. Um, and I think, you know, to counter the, the, the rise of fake news, we're always going to have it. Uh, the role of social media is, is, is paramount. But I think the importance of science-backed information um, was certainly tested here. Um, and the World Health Organization certainly uh, upped its, its presence on social media, trying to give facts of, of, of what is going on. So what's, so what's next? That was, you know, the, the beginning. We're now coming into something what I could like to call Act Two. And if we think that, that we had difficulties in the, in the beginning, transporting PPE and, and diagnostic equipment, um, you know, we, we, we've got a massive challenge ahead of us, which of course is, is the rollout of, of the vaccines. And I think you know, this is timely. It went live yesterday in the UK um, with, the, with the adaption and, and the approval of the Pfizer biotech. Uh, the UK is, is, is rolling that out. And of course, other countries have also started trials. Um, some of the challenges, obviously, uh, it's a huge amount of, of vials, you know, 10, 10 billion doses, the numbers out there that, that we believe, but of course, no one really knows whether it's a single dose or double dose. Um, the challenge, the main challenge is maintaining an unbroken cold chain and chain of custody. Uh, this, is, this is really, really important. If, if you don't control the temperature, 
And if we don't know where the, 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 the vaccines are and that risk and tampering, um, they're not going to be able to be used. Um, is the global logistics uh, industry ready to support them with the pharma manufacturing? It's not just the end product of the vials coming out of the factory. You have to have API, active pharmaceutical ingredient being flown and shipped from all across the world into these manufacturing facilities. There are currently 237 vaccines uh, in development. Uh, 38 of those are in clinical trials. So it's not just about the, the, the big blockbuster names that we keep hearing on the news. It's, it's, it's gonna be absolutely global and, and therefore the logistics chain has to be robust. We also have the challenge of the rise of counterfeit vaccines. Uh, counterfeit drugs have been out there for many, many years. Um, the organized criminal syndicates are certainly looking at this as, a, as an opportunity. And we as an industry have to make sure that if we are transporting vaccines, that we do it in, in, in such a way that they can't be tampered with and we always keep track of them. There's the challenge of reverse logistics and recall. Uh, we all know that these vaccines are, have been tested in unprecedented clinical trial timelines, um, eight to nine months where normally a vaccine should be tested over three or four years. There is a risk of recall. Um, and when that happens, the logistics industry uh, and the medical industry has to be ready to be able to recall those, those vials. Um, and of course, the, something else which is non-logistical but does hamper the efforts of a vaccination program is the rise of anti-vaccine campaigns. We all have our own opinions of whether we want to be vaccinated or not, um, but it is quite a loud campaign and it's, it's, uh, it's something that needs to be addressed as well if we want the vaccination program to be successful. Some of the solutions to those challenges, again, we've talked about it before, but um, I think manufacturing has to become more local. Not only is it more sustainable, you're creating jobs for the, for your, for the, for the, for the countries, but logistically um, it helps. We've seen examples, uh, Australia has uh, made a deal with AstraZeneca and Oxford University where the vaccine will be produced using a, a local manufacturer in Australia. That not only um, increases the chance of, of a valid cold chain because you don't have to fly this around the world, but it's, it's also a lot easier to distribute around the country. We've got to, to make sure we use qualified actors. And those are packaging companies, logistics companies who have the experience, airlines who want to be part of the solution. Um, we've seen a lot of investment from many, many different companies, UPS in the US, DHL globally, uh, have been investing millions of dollars to be ready for this day. Um, I think there's gonna be a lot of Me Too people out there, but you've got to make sure that if you're using a logistics company or a packaging company or an airline, they know what they're talking about. One thing is absolutely paramount, and that is visibility. We need to see where the shipment is, where the vaccine is, is it at the right temperature, is it in the right hands? Um, the industry, unfortunately, is very much on passive tracking, which means that we, we get to find out the temperature after it arrives at a location. That's not good enough. We need to know the temperature as it's going through uh, the, the logistic cycle so we can actually take measures as and when something goes wrong. I think we need to consider serialization at vial level so we can actually track not just the pallet or the box of, of, of vaccines, but actually where it's going to. Uh, this is particularly important for recall. Something else we need to consider as an industry is the um, uh, waste management. Uh, this is all biological hazards. Um, it needs to be incinerated. Uh, there are some countries that just don't have this equipment, incinerators and so forth in place, and that has to be managed. I think all of this is doable. It's manageable. Um, there's not one company or one organization that can do this. It is going to be uh, a concerted effort between private and public partnerships. So um, hope is on its way. And uh, thank you very much. And I'm happy to take questions afterwards. Thank you. Well, thank Michael. You. I... OK, thank you, Michael, for sharing your valuable insight. I think Mike has a question. Michael Slapon has a question for you. Yeah, I couldn't wait, so I already started. Um, Michael, um, about the, the local manufacturing, you said, to avoid indeed logistics uh, complexity. Yeah. Um, for us as an industry, the opposite is the, is the case. We would like to select very big manufacturers. So we selected SJ&J for 1 billion doses for next year, 
we're looking for about three or four drug product manufacturers. Um, the reason for us is to avoid technology transfer to those um, manufacturers. Do you think also when we select only a few manufacturers and not localize that uh, logistics can be managed? Thanks, Mikey. It's a good, good question. I, I really think it depends on, on, on your market. If you, if you are manufacturing in Europe and it's for the Europe and the US market, I think it makes sense to concentrate your manufacturing process in Europe. But if you're, if you're manufacturing for Asia and you're buying your active pharmaceutical ingredient in China and flying it to Europe to be produced and then filled in India and then flown from India to the Asia, it doesn't make sense. Honestly, I think the risks of that supply chain going wrong somewhere along the, 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 the way is quite high, uh, not, not to, to mention the cost, of course. Um, it's interesting what you said about knowledge transfer, because I, I, I believe, and we don't want to get into a lecture here, but I believe that in this state of the world, we need to be sharing information. We need to be making sure that we're all on the same um, page and I know that there are many different vaccines and many different engineering processes out there but um, you know if I go back to AstraZeneca and Oxford University they seem to have found a solution where they can get into partnership with local manufacturing pharma manufacturing companies in Australia I think in Thailand as well they've signed up where they protect that um, so I don't know how they ring fence it but I think that seems to be a good solution. Mm, thank you Michael. Yeah, we'll take it in account. Good luck. Okay, next, Richard, would you like to have a question for Michael? Good morning, Michael. Um, one of the things that comes across is obviously the complexities of the distribution network and the temperature um, that we need to hold throughout this. Fine in the developed world, but for, with your WHO hat on or, or with that knowledge, do you see further problems in countries that aren't so developed? So it, it's it's a million dollar question, Richard. You know, are we ready? Of course, of course, we're not. You know, we've never we that the world has never planned for this. I mean, we we've, we've done as much planning as possible. You know, I think the one positive uh, message I would say is that that Covax, which is 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 the governing body, to really make sure that all countries of of you know. Uh, low-income countries have access have ex ex unequitable access to the vaccines. Uh, UNICEF has been has been tasked with the logistics on that, um, and and the target to is to distribute two billion vaccines in 2021. Now UNICEF transports and manages those kind of volumes anyway already. So I think UNICEF is up to it. I think Covax is up to it. I think the challenges will be. As and when we get deep into the countries, I think uh, the organizations are very good at moving the cold chain between countries and to the, to the airport. I think once you start going in country, uh, deep into Africa, deep into to countries where there are no roads, where you have to use boats and you have to use other vehicles, I think that will be a challenge. And that's where we're looking for the industry to come up with solutions, perhaps solar powered um, cold chain um, facilities and, and packaging because there is no electricity in some of these countries. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Michael. Okay, we will uh, move on to the next presentation. The next speaker is Mike Mikin from DHL Supply Chain. Mike will share the innovations that have developed in DHL due to this year's pandemic. Mike, over to you. Okay, I'm hopefully sharing my slides. Um... Okay, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, following on from uh, Michael's presentation, I'm, I'm just going to give a, a quick whiz through some of the sort of challenges that we face within the um, logistics uh, industry. I'm going to sort of touch on, there was a lot of things, as Michael sort of uh, intimated in his presentation, with, let's say, fashion and retail and how they quickly moved into dealing with face masks, et cetera. There was a lot of things going on 
within life sciences, within um, the logistics uh, industry at the same time. And that sort of took us into looking at both active and passive solutions because um, probably about six, seven months ago, it was quite clear um, on the back of maybe our clinical trials knowledge, but a lot of these products um, or vaccines as they were gonna be developed, were gonna be handled at very cold temperatures. So I think that got a lot of organizations thinking, okay, if this is gonna be the, the world for the next um, six to nine months, you know, have we got those, that infrastructure in place to be able to store, handle, and distribute products at uh, ultra low temperatures? The other thing, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time today, but just around the whole innovation piece, Michael did touch on some of these, uh, but there's a lot of other things going on which need to complement the whole active and passive uh, temperature monitoring, whether that be with uh, loggers or using gateways so that you can actually see what's going on in an active way in real time in the supply chain. But uh, there are other developments taking place with um, uh, digitalization and the use of uh, robotics. And also I just wanted to briefly touch around um, some of the clinical trials works that's been going on because as we speak, um, you know, DHL has been involved in some of the clinical trials of some of the vaccine, vaccine producers. So from that, that's sort of uh, given us some insight on some of the challenges that we would get as those products then move to um, uh, being a commercial product that could be launched in the market. And one other thing as well, which I think we shouldn't lose mind sight of, which Michael covered, uh, there was three areas in his act too, and that's the whole piece around serialization, counterfeit, anti-counterfeiting, and being able to handle product recalls. And I, I sit on a panel with, uh, well, with a leadership team of GS1 Healthcare, and there's a lot of good work taking place in that area too. So, um, kicking off first with the clinical trials and sort of pick up this particular point. Um, this has been an area that I've been heavily involved in about the last 15 years within DHL. And there has been a lot of work to try and digitalize. And it's picking up on the point that Michael mentioned around, you've got um, products going through from, you know, the actual point of manufacture straight through. And there are a number of uh, similarities with the way some clinical trial studies are handled and the way this vaccine uh, will be handled. The big difference is the volume. Um, so that's probably where we had started off with a lot of our experience within uh, handling ULT, you know, the ultra low temperature freezers, which only hold small volumes of products. And that sort of took us down a particular route in being able to handle this. Um, putting that into context, we've got a couple of big challenges. Um, uh, as Michael mentioned in his uh, slide, if you look at this particular slide, which is from two sources, the top left is from the Duke of uh, Global Innovation Center. And they've pumped out a lot of um, excellent material in the last uh, few weeks. And also one from Bloomberg, which um, talks about airlines facing the mission of the century to be able to move these vaccines. Because whilst there is a certain amount of uh, local manufacturer going on, um, what you do see on this graph are the three colors of um, uh, built around um, the, um, the, those countries which have got high incomes and can afford uh, and are paying for vaccines which are going into those markets as you see in the chilled payload uh, diagram. And they will include things like the uh, so the phase of vaccine that's already arrived and was being uh, used as of yesterday. But then others, you know, like Moderna, um, Janssen and uh, CureVac. And then you've got other companies which are specializing maybe more in the low income uh, where you've got the, uh, the Sputnik or the Sinovac type uh, vaccines. And then uh, there is, if we talk COVAX and others, where you've got the supply chains required to be able to get into the, um, the global entities. Um, 
Now the Oxford uh, or um, AstraZeneca obviously covers all three and that has been one of their aims. But the interesting thing when you actually then look, as these vaccines start to come to, to use, most of them are in the minus 70 sort of area. And that sort of has focused airlines and logistics providers into saying, well, how are we gonna handle this? So um, the way we started, as I sort of linked back to clinical trials, DHL would use a number of ULTs, but we would tend to use these maybe a few in each of our hubs handling high value biologics that needed to be or uh, orphan drugs. Um, so they are very low volume, but a high value that needed this type of uh, system. And uh, this is uh, some photographs of some of our um, hubs around the globe, where what we've seen since the summer is a lot of investment in ULT freezers from different suppliers Primarily, we've gone for the up, upright, but we have used with some of our clinical trials, like in Japan, um, with the chest type uh, ultra low temperature freezers. So there are different types. But this has sort of taken us down one particular route where we've now having to adapt and use clever ways of being able to use this type of active equipment uh, where you can actually quickly inbound products into these freezers and at the same time get the products out in high volume as and when the the vaccines need to go you know whether it's direct or into other supply chains whilst that was going on in the summer uh, another story is um it was quite clear to be able to get into a situation where you could build the ideal solution in a large freezer and you can see in the photograph on the right hand side this is taken inside one of our large uh, three, 4,000 pallet type um, large deep freezers, which is operating at uh, below minus 20. But we need to be in the sort of minus 70. And you can see here the KTM 42 that we were uh, testing in the summer. Um, we were achieving easily temperatures of minus 74 with the probes that were in there. And even with the door opening to be re-iced every sort of 10 days, um, the temperatures would quickly go back up, very similar to using an ultra low temperature freezer. So from an innovative uh, perspective, one of the things that I'm seeing is maybe if I flick um, back, that might be the new way some of our warehouses start to look, less racking, but lots more, maybe hundreds of these uh, ULTs for storage. But one of the other challenges we do have is these products are being shipped to different parts of the supply chain. So you've got products that maybe are in the primary distribution, which, or they might need to be stored in overflow facilities and the ULT uh, deep freezer isn't the right solution. So one of the things also of looking at is, has been to be a bit innovative and take some equipment that was designed to, to perhaps only operate at minus 20, but now we could, by using it in different conditions, in different environments, stretch that so that we could operate for a lot longer. And what was designed maybe as a transport only type product can become a transport and uh, supply product. Link that with the technologies of the loggers, because these things do come with their own Bluetooth technology you can do a lot more clever things so these things become intelligent. And then flipping back to the previous slide with ULTs, I see there being maybe opportunities here to merge the two types of solutions so that you might see ULTs being used alongside um, KTMs. So at that point, I, um, uh, I've shared my details on the screen if anybody wants to pick up of any of this afterwards on, online. Um, but um, yeah, I'm happy to take any um, questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for sharing your experiences. Let me take some questions from the panel. So Richard, what is your question, Michael. Mike? Thank you. Good morning, Michael. Um, it was just one of the things that, that comes up that the minus well not be with us for as long as the other 
temperatures will be in the fact that those temperatures may well come to a higher temperatures, minus 20, um, more the sort of things we're used to. Could you therefore see the sort of investment in these freezer farms is maybe becoming a white elephant? It, that's a good question. Um, and I think that's why we're looking at two different approaches. Um, because you, the initial vaccines that are coming to market and the ones going into the high income countries, um, the, f the first batch of those are handling those types of temperatures. So there is a uh, requirement. One of the things that might happen with the investment in ULTs could be that people look to say, well, we've made that investment. It might be an opportunity for new types of um, personalized medicine, um, other gene therapies. So it actually puts uh, assets out there to do more uh, clever things in the future. But picking up on the point, yes, around um, I can quickly see, because uh, the AstraZeneca product, for instance, um, that's likely to be handled at two to eight around the globe. So whilst it might be in the primary distribution of very, an ultra low temperature product, um, when it gets into the actual final mile, it'll be handled at traditional temperatures. So that reinforces your point that is this only a 12 month window where you need to operate um, ULTs. But um, I think um, overall, I think it's a mixed uh, picture. And that is why I, um, looking at maybe merging the technologies, I think is a clever thing to do. Thank you. And um, Mike Sullivan, would you like to ask some question? Yeah, one, one question I have. Um, we, we are facing a similar problem. Um, you just mentioned that indeed, um, it's not just only about during the transportation. It's also once it arrives, the products in the country. So our order vaccines are more stored at two to eight. So in most countries, we as j, &J don't have minus 20 degrees, what we need now for the vaccine. So are you building up sufficient capacity Indeed, which we could maybe rent for a couple of months at, a st um, at local storage in the country? Yes, um, we, we have two ways. The photograph I had on the screen, which you saw of the two KTM boxes, was in one of our deep freezers. Um, so organ but large 3PL companies will have lots of freezers because it's amazing um, if you take food, um, ice cream, frozen chicken, um, we invest in a lot of deep freezers in all of the types of uh, equipment around the globe. So that, that's not uncommon. The other thing that we do do in life sciences, we've got a number of very good partners who can put in large pre-validated solutions, which are modular. And there are a lot of um, vaccine manufacturers um, in UK and Europe, where I've worked, have used these for maybe building up flu vaccines. So if I go back 10 years, when um, we've done things like flu vaccines, we've been able to bring in for maybe so many months, uh, a solution which is modular. And these things can be built quite quickly. Some of them can be delivered. They already come with lights and equipment kitted out. Um, so there are, you know, suppliers like, uh, Dawson's is probably one of the ones uh, I'm used to using who can come in with a quick solution because that could be the clever way of utilizing something like the KTMs with a deep frozen quick solution. Gives you that flexibility because there's nothing worse that with the ULTs, you're, you're against the clock. If you have a power surge or whatever, they'll stay at that temperature maybe for four or five hours. Um, so you've really got to work fast. It's, we have a term that it's like working in a Formula One pit lane with working with ULTs. There's no time for error. You've got to be very quick and efficient and investing in rented equipment is an absolute good idea, yeah. Thank you. Um, Michael, do you have any question? Yeah, Mike, very, very interesting. Thank you. It, it sounds like DHL is really getting prepared. I, I think following on to, to Mike's question, um, DHL is known for its innovation and, and its flexibility. 
uh, to adapting to market needs. And I've seen that DHLs expanded into other areas such as airline handling in the UK and things like that. Do you foresee that DHL would extend its services in terms of the vaccine program in, in not just delivering the vaccines, but also managing the waste, uh, managing perhaps uh, mobile incinerators that you could bring to a hospital to, to manage that. Um, we've talked about uh, mobile, you know, ultra cold um, units you know, is, is there anything more in the terms of the offering that DHL could, could offer just, uh, uh, again, further than, than the logistics around the, the, the vaccines? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, some of the things you touched on, Michael, uh, like around um, the traceability counterfeiting, and also, as you mentioned, yeah. the waste. Um, there are a number of projects, and there is one company which... Um, is in that group of 10, um, which is looking to bring um, a very deep frozen product to market. One of the things that, um, as, as you would know from uh, working in like clinical trials uh, or doing postponement, there is always a, a requirement to do labeling. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that is already a requirement in Europe um, is that some countries uh, whilst the, it is allowed to use vaccines in English, there are seven countries in Europe, including the Netherlands, Belgium, Greece, um, and a couple of others that spring to mind, require under national law to have their own uh, country-specific patient information leaflets. So already we're seeing a requirement with some customers to ensure that there is like a kitting, packing process yeah. as the vaccines go out. So it's not just a case of doing that. But then taking that a stage further, there is a lot looking at using things like QR codes for customer information. So rather than using yeah. the paper, can we use technology? Sure. Uh, that is something that DHL is looking at. Around yeah. the other areas you've mentioned, that, that is something that we already do. Um, uh, now, it's not legal, if that's the right word, in Europe to ship the vaccines and some of the ancillary equipment separately. There is a requirement, the syringes and everything else all go together. But um, there is a link to this and a lot of that's deep frozen. We're doing quite a lot of work around the diagnostics piece. So the places that are doing the vaccines are also requiring to do a lot of um, swabbing and other work. Yeah. So we've got yeah. like a parallel supply chain going on with a lot of medical devices and diagnostics. Yeah. Uh, and then supplementing that, for instance, in the UK with the NHS, there's a lot of requirements to set up vaccination centres, which then requires the infrastructure to put in booths and do other things to support those types of organisations. Waste management is something that logistics companies do do. Um, and that is, you're absolutely right, with all of the biohazardous waste, that is something which I could see most logistics providers being able to sort of um, come up with a solution. So hopefully, I think it's a very good question. And I think, I know we're doing probably about 70% of what you mentioned, yeah. somewhere in the globe today, but there is probably a lot more we could all do. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mike and all the panels. The next, Speaker is Richard Dudbridge from Tower Cold Chain Solutions. Richard is going to discuss the challenges and issues for the frozen vaccine distribution and Tower's innovations. Please welcome Richard. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, thank you for this opportunity um, and thank you for the previous speakers. It's uh, very interesting. So um, for those of you who don't know Tower, we make a range of thermal insulated containers, which are reusable and passive. Um, and we started our journey on this about five, six months ago, when I received a phone call from someone on this panel, actually, saying, Richard, have you heard about the minus 70, minus 65 stuff that's coming down the line with COVID-19? Um, to which the answer was, well, kind of. And it really is like a tsunami, as far as we're concerned, in the fact that um, we kind of stood on the beach, all the water's gone, and we know it's coming back, but we don't really know how big it's going to be and the volumes to expect. We can get a good idea, but the information coming from the pharmaceutical industry 
is sketchy because they're racing so fast to be the first to be vaccine and also to get their product sorted. So we now got the first cross the line, which obviously is Pfizer. And in the UK, as it's been stated, we had the first injections uh, being given yesterday, uh, which was great to see. Um, the temperature profiles that are coming from the industry, as everyone has mentioned, are challenging, particularly the minus 65. Um, this gives challenges in storage, as Mike dis uh, discussed earlier, and also challenges in distribution. Within this cold environment, there's also huge health and safety issues. For those working with the product, it's not the best place to be. So at the moment, the numbers just don't bear thinking about. So the world population is 7.5 billion, approximately. If we say 75% are immunized, that's 5.6 billion. Two doses each, which seems to be the general uh, rule of thumb. That's 11.2 billion injections. One vial on average contains about five doses. So that's 2.24 billion vials. And just to put that into context for all of us involved in the cold chain industry, there currently is 180 million flu vaccines made annually. And just again, just to sort of bring that home, 100 million in a billion. So it is enormous. The amount of challenge and the amount of work and logistics that is coming down the line is huge. And for distribution generally, it's going to be a major challenge, regardless of the, the temperatures. Um, the temperature seems to range from somewhere in the region of 2.8, uh, sorry, 2 to 8 to minus 65 degrees, with a number of the products going through various temperature ranges as they go through their journey. So if we looked at the first one, um, after the phone call I had, the first we, we broke it down into two slides. So we've got storage, which is the first challenge, and then we've got distribution. So the storage. Well, the challenge of storing at minus 65, as Mike said earlier, is fine for biologicals and small amounts, high value, but we're talking huge amounts here. So we needed to look at bigger warehousing. If you look at that, the machinery, machinery at that temperature is highly specialized. Availability is scarce and the demand will be huge and it will only grow. As we said, health and safety issues are extensive and they're costly and dangerous. People do not work very well in minus 65 environments. Um, they certainly can't work there for long. As I said, machinery is inclined to go wrong. It's just a bad place to be. To actually then power warehousing type facilities, which is what you'd need, a huge power consumption, the um, compressors, et cetera, needed to produce that. Um, would be very poor. Um, many countries don't even have that sort of supply of electricity and it's certainly um, unreliable. And the infrastructure itself is just not there. So in the past, this is a, a KT400, which will last for uh, minus 65 for about 120 hours at plus 30 degrees. And that's been used for API and it's still being used for API. Um, and it's been used for biologicals. But again, it was just not big enough for what the industry was requiring. So again, if we look at the transport, if we look at what we had in our repertoire, again, at minus 65, the KT400, which is the box you can see on your screen, was usually used for small shipments, as I said, API, biologicals. Um, it's limited to, to the amount of dry ice you can put on a plane. Obviously, you can put 250 kgs in any parcel on uh, the plane. However, you're only carrying a fairly small amount of product, so about 400 liters. And we're looking at holding temperatures with a delta T in excess of 100 degrees. So if you think about it, that's trying to keep an ice cube frozen in boiling water. That's the challenges we have when we talk about these ultra low temperatures. Furthermore, a lot of the lanes that are now being discussed are not the usual lanes. This is mainly because um, we're using uh, pharmaceuticals, we're using CMOs 
to manufacture these products in places where we wouldn't normally expect. So we have different production sites. And again, we have all sorts of production uh, product issues and health and safety. So what was Tara's answer to this? Well, we have a, a unit called a KT42, which is a double Euro pallet shipper. It also has two doors, which became very useful during this exercise. So what we can do with this is, um, and if I just go back and show you, sorry, and I'm hoping this will work. Cross your fingers. There we go. So this is a KTM 42. So it's a double Euro pallet shipper. And we modified it so it could take dry ice. And this is what was shown um, on Mike's slides earlier on. We've modified it so it would take dry ice. And these will go in trays, as you can see now. And these are fitted in the top and the bottom, which gives a good um, cold chain and also stops the circulation of air, which is what you want to do. Load can then be placed in. It's a bit like a Harry Potter special, this. And then the door is closed. So in a cold environment, and as we did with, with Mike, these will last for about 10 days um, at these temperatures. But then the next problem was, well, how do we reload it? We don't want people in that box itself. We don't want them breathing in the fumes and we don't really want them in minus 80 conditions either. So what we've done is you have another set of plates and you just push the existing plates out, which are expired, and put the new plates in. And even for an old man like me, I can do that in less than five minutes. Um, if I can get this off the screen. So that's where we went. So we looked at the KT42. As I said, the two door means that the workforce do not have to actually enter the product, enter the box, nor do they disturb the product. The load stays in place during the icing. The ice can be replaced from the outside of the unit which makes health and safety issues far better. You also don't need a constant external energy supply. As Mike said, we, these have been placed in freezers, big uh, shed freezers. Um, but if they were to warm, it wouldn't make any difference. These things will work quite happily in normal in, in, in ambient conditions. They can be stored in conventional 3P, 3PL freezers, as Mike said, um, within DHL and with all the 3PLs. All of them have these big warehouses which sit at minus 20 degrees. These KT42s can just sit within there. If it's in third world countries or countries that don't have the infrastructure or you only need a smaller amount, they can be placed inside a reefer. So again, a normal uh, petrol driven, diesel driven reefer with an external temperature of uh, minus 20 degrees. Again, you can hold that temperature for 10 days. If the reefer goes wrong, again, you've got days to sort this out as opposed to hours. And one of the big things I think is it's a temporary solution. From my question to Mike earlier on, I do feel that this minus 60 will be a, a transient thing. And the reason we have these temperatures is because the pharmaceutical industries have been racing to get to a finished product. The stability data is not all there and they will be working hard to bring that down. So that's from the storage side. From the transportation, we looked at the same unit again, but we had slightly different um, profile to look at. For a start, you can only put 250 kgs roughly in any given parcel on a plane. So it made sense to have the biggest unit we possibly could with that amount of dry ice in there. So again, the KTM 42, which is a double Euro pallet shipper. So I sat down and, and spoke with WFP, DHL, lots of different people and said, roughly, what's the longest these units are going to be left outside the normal controlled environment? So we looked at about 30 hours was the absolute maximum that it would be um, seen to the elements while it was going through customs, while it was sat on the tarmac while it was in the plane, while it was getting off the other end, 
before it got back to a cold facility again. So that was our aim. But in actual fact, with 250 kgs of dry ice, it lasts for 94 hours. And I've actually put the graph here. So if it's at 30 degrees, you're probably looking at 80 hours or so. We can keep it down to minus 25, we're up around 10 days. So that gives you an idea of how these units will work. They're completely validated and they're easy to load and unload. If you only want to take one load, one of the pallets out, you can do just that. It can be used on trucks or planes. One of the things that's showing a lot of interest in these is AZ, for instance, as we discussed, are building a lot, uh, making a lot of their vaccines um, in country or in continent and then moving them from one place to another by trucks. These will fit on the back of trucks and again will give minus 80 storage or minus 75 storage, which is what they're saying they need. It doesn't need any specialised handling. It's passive. It's reusable, which is the other thing. If we use thousands and thousands or millions of EPS shippers, that in itself is going to cause major issues. Um, as Mike said, it's a cloud-based logger, which can be used with various gateways, which will actually show you um, what it's doing and what it's done. So that's our um, answers to it for both the transportation and the uh, storage of Minus 65 product. And I don't know if anyone would have any questions. Okay, thank you, Richard, for your presentation. Those are some very timely innovations. I will take some questions from the panel. So, Michael, do you have any question for Richard? Thanks, Richard. Yeah, very innovative. I, I love the fact that you can actually re-ice this without <clears throat> taking the cargo out. That's 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 what the industry needs. The KT four hundred is really around minus sixty five, and I'm going to perhaps come from a different angle. The the area of the world that I operate in, which is very much the Pacific. Um, you know, first of all, we have no dry ice in these islands. It, you, you have to fly dry ice in from, from Australia to, to get it there. Also, there's many countries without steady power. Um, and, and so, you know, if we think about the challenges and, and it doesn't necessarily, I, I don't think it's gonna be the requirement of minus 65. I think we need the requirement of two to eight. That's the standard vaccine, which I think these areas will receive is there a product that tower has developed or is developing which is you know small enough that health workers can carry uh it can be powered by solar panels that they can recharge the the, the gel packs or whatever we're doing um because this is this is great for i think for international transport but what what we need is is also a lot of uh, assistance in the field um and and often many vaccines suffer on the last mile. It's that, it's that last 30 kilometer walk, cycle, motorbike with a esky on the back that just doesn't work. So perhaps you could just give me a little bit more information on, on what you have around the two to eight and, and the, the mobile um, options. Thank you. Okay, so two to eight. So our standard business, if you like, so the KTM 42 that you just saw there and the KT 400, both can be used at two to eight. And all you do is change the coolant plates inside of which we use PCMs. For the final mile, as you say, it's the smaller containers. Um, and again, we do have a range of smaller containers, which will use PCMs. So they need to be frozen down. So it's a standard um, unit of which we have been producing for years and the industry is fairly well set up. This was really to explain how we've reacted to the the need and the demand of what's been placed on us with these new temperatures. With regards to the standard product and the product standard product temperatures, of course, we, we can still do that as we've always been able to do. The um, solar panels, it's all very interesting, these technical things, but we have found to our cost sometimes in the past, if you go too technical, it can go wrong. Simple is best, it really is. So if you can use a, a simple phase change plate, with a highly insulative box, you get far better results, generally speaking, particularly in countries that are not so um, set up for, for using such product. Okay, so next, uh, Mike Slipan, do you have any question? 
Well, I have a question about from um, some people think that these solutions are necessary only for like one or two years until, like you said, the majority of people are vaccinated, maybe 60 percent. Um, however, um, you are being like quite an investment in building up these uh, stock of these uh, containers. Um, do you think indeed, what is your expectation, how long these kind of solutions will last? Okay, so one of, the, one of the things we had to do and have done is the units that are now being modified to take minus uh, 65 product can be moved quite quickly back to 2 to 8 or minus 20 or back to their normal roles in life. And again, that's one of the um, assets that some people are looking at, that they can take these units and they can start life as minus 65 units and then with uh, very easy to modify them back to two to eight or minus 20 or plus 15 plus 25. So the idea is that the investment, although they're obviously making them in the first place, once this is over, you don't end up with a white elephant. They can be put back to their normal usage. So that's where we're looking right. at this one. Thank you. Okay, Mike Mikin, any questions on this subject? Yeah, and also just um, following up on the question Mike, uh, Mike asked, um, um, uh, we have had some vaccine producers also because of the time limits, as Richard was sort of explaining where you could take something from minus 70. Um, there are There is a bit of work going on about could the logistics provider help in the almost like thawing process if that's a good way of describing it. Because if we use like the Pfizer example that the products held at around about minus 70, minus 80, by the time it then gets into a two to eight environment, it can then be used within five days. Well, there are other developers who are then looking at maybe that process taking part within the supply chain quite an innovative thing and there's a certain amount of work taking place in that. There was a, a question also just wanted to pick up around um, uh, traceability. Um, what I will share, there were two documents published yesterday around things like returns, recalls um, and uh, handling counterfeits. Uh, as I say, I sit on the GS1 healthcare leadership uh, team and we've been working on a number of uh, projects exactly around this because we've all been trying to get barcodes on vaccines anyway um, so what we want to try and ensure is as we go down the covid route we don't want to sort of get the pressure of getting the goods out there shortcut the identi identity and the batches and that type of information on those products so there's a lot of good work going on and my other question i wanted just to ask richard was on the back of what Michael mentioned, if we're shipping into places like the Pacific where there is a shortage of CO2, uh, is the best solution the KT400D, um, or which goes with dry ice and then you've got five or six days for it to operate, or are there smaller KT type products that Tower has which um, are almost like a parcel size, so it's even smaller again. It's just understanding which is the best way to go. Yeah, um, it, it, um, we don't do the very small parcels, but we do do um, smaller ones. So the 400 really for this market would probably about the smallest we do. We do a 70 as well, which you can also use with dry ice. Um, and you can use with phase change material again. So that's a robust product, it will last for 120 hours at plus 30 again, plus 30 ambient. So it will do what you're requesting it to do. Um, the th interesting you said about the um, starting at minus 80 and ending up at two to eight, for instance, we had one recently where we had to pick up samples from Africa. So it was the other way around to a certain extent, and they wanted it at two to eight degrees when it arrived, but it was right out in the bush. So we froze the unit right down using PCM plates way below their normal temperature range and then allowed it to warm up on its journey from it was Brussels across to Africa. 
where it was then transported on the back of a Land Rover to the site where they were collecting the samples. By the time it got there, it was still below zero. So they had to actually open the lid and let it warm up a bit to two to eight. They then put the samples in and brought them back to the UK. And that was something like 17 day transit and it worked fine. So we can do all these sort of things. I think one of the, the frustrations is if people ask us exactly what it is they want to do, we can invariably come up with the answer. Uh, and it's to say, come to your, you know, people like yourselves, ask us the questions and then see what we can come up with because often there is an answer. Thank you. Okay, good. Okay, so the last speaker is uh, Mike Slapen from Yansen Pharma. Michael will be looking at the challenges Yansen Pharma experienced at the early days of the COVID outbreak and some of the innovative idea they have implemented to overcome those issues. Mike, over to you. Thank you, Linda. I'm sharing my screen. Good. Well, indeed, it's about challenges and how challenges sometimes can turn into innovations, um, which is definitely not easy. Um, let me see. Yeah. So first, a very quick introduction to J&J, &J, because it's not just about the vaccines. These days, we're only speaking about vaccines, but 99.8% of our products are non-vaccines. So we have three divisions, and I'd like to share very quickly with you from what happens in the COVID period with these products in these divisions. So the first one is the medical devices and diagnostics. You see there are many kind of surgery products in there, artificial knees until very simple uh, stretches, which are being used during surgery. And the demand decreased tremendously because nobody dared to go to the hospital anymore being afraid of being infected by other patients. And on the other hand, the hospitals were fully focused on treating COVID patients. So the demand decreased tremendously. And we expect maybe somewhere towards the end of the year, there will be a kind of um, new peak in these kind of surgeries, and then the demand will increase suddenly. The second division, which is the biggest division of J&J, is the pharmaceutical division. And that's also where I'm working for. And what happened here with the pharmaceutical division, initially, everybody started to build up stock, making sure that the patients have sufficient supply. Often, the patients got supplied to their homes for self-treatment. And what we then see later on, after a couple of months, they had three, four months, it stabilized. So we are back to a normal level. And then the last one, and that's most people are familiar with, is a consumer section. So you see the Tyrenols, the pills, you see the Listerine. And what happened here is that these products um, very much uh, spiked and a huge demand came up. Everybody was demand to hand gel and stuff. So indeed, this one was a, um, a peak in demand and that gave us quite some challenges to supply on time. Yeah. So the rest of the slides is about the pharmaceutical part only. So if we look at the product life cycles and which products we have, you see that we have about 220 products, um, sorry, 120 products in our portfolio in Janssen. And those products, they are in two segments. One is the products which are um, past the patent expiry. So products where um, also other alternatives are in the market. So there's about for 93 products in 150 countries. We are not the only supplier. There are many other suppliers who can pick up if we could not deliver. But our concern is about these 23 products, which are we still patent protection, and we are the only supplier, and we cannot afford that the patients are running out of these stocks. So the logistics for these two, three product, 23 products was really critical and difficult during the season, especially during the first five, six months, where uh, suddenly we see less um, logistic capabilities of actually capacity. So we have been focusing on these 23 products mainly, that we don't run out of stock. 
So in the complexity, I would like to demonstrate just in a, in a simple value chain map, which we make for each product, which shows on the left side, shows the API, where's the API coming from, and then goes to formulation filling or tableting, it's the next step, going to labeling and, and packaging, then going to the distribution centers, and finally it's going to the wholesalers. You see that for one product here, it's already quite complex. I think it was Michael who said from don't make for vaccines, don't make it as complex as this. Often with the volumes which we're talking about now, it cannot be fully avoided, but the message is clear. Yeah? So for a product going to indeed here in Europe somewhere, we have about five flights, which all require complex logistics to get to the final customer. We did manage it. Um, but we had a significantly challenge during the um, after that was mostly when in Italy, in Europe, the outbreak became imminent. And later on, when US indeed the outbreak was, we saw a significant reduction in flights and especially in cargo availability. So we had to work with um, airlines to secure the flights. Um, but that was not possible we had to sometimes validate different routes. So for example, where previously we had a direct shipment from US to Belgium, we couldn't do anymore as there was no passenger flights and therefore um, those routes were not longer available. So what we did is we did a paper exercise. How can we indeed validate very quickly different routes was managed. Also within Europe, we use much more trucking than flights. And then really, if there was no other um, solution, we checked if it can be supplied from another manufacturing site. So with these four mitigations, we could mitigate the uh, out of stock situation. All these challenges were nothing compared to the development of the COVID vaccine. That's really, as you can imagine, a big challenge where we normally take about five to seven years for a vaccine development. To give you an example, for HIV, we are already developing for eight years and we're still not on the market. And we now had to develop and launch the COVID vaccine in nine months. That was the target. Um, the consequences of this is for cold chain shipments that we don't have enough stability data. The first batches were only produced like four months ago, meaning that we, at this moment, when we're also close to launch, we only have three months stability data. Still, we have to manage it. And as you can see here, um, these are the six front runners in, in the vaccines. Um, we do have to manage the frozen temperatures. We are not at minus 70. For us, we have to keep at minus 20, the frozen conditions. That is until we, um, we thaw it. And after thawing, we have three months where we can store the products two to eight. Compared to some of, product, uh, of other competitors, it's luxury, but for us, it's still a challenge. And especially those frozen conditions, minus 20 in our case, we don't have the capability in many countries. So we are building up capacity, hence my question earlier, I think it was to Mike, how can we manage this? A problem which occurred is that we cannot anticipate what is the expiry date. The expiry date depends on when this thawing takes place and when we start storing at two to eight. From that moment, it's three months. But that's for every batch, for every country, um, for every file, it's different. So what we are trying to do is we build up more and data on our stability that we can extend the three months to longer. But at the moment at launch, it's the three months. So what we need to find out is how can we come up with a solution for a dynamically changing shelf life? How can the customer see if the product is still maintained in good conditions? So what we came up is that once we change from minus 20, we change to two to eight in our SAP system, we trigger 
an event saying, okay, this is now going to, at this date, it's going to 228. And then what we have is the files. It was mentioned before with working with QR codes. It's a, it's a great solution. So the QR codes here indicates it's unique for this file, it's unique for this batch. Next to that, we have a 2D um, code which is also still printed. And this combination of these two enables the customer to see whether the product has been stored in good conditions. So how does it work? The nurse can scan with her own um, mobile phone. She can scan the QR code on the file, reads out if it's indeed um, valid. It also is about counterfeiting. Then we have it. In the, in the app, it asks you to also scan the 2D barcode. And then within seconds, it connects to our SAP system and it returns to the screen of the mobile phone, whether it's within expiry or it was expired or the product is recalled. So I think this is one of the great innovations which came up in very short term. We had to develop this, but we definitely gonna use this in future products as well. That's what I like to share in the short 10 minutes which we have, and happy to take any questions. Yeah, um, <clears throat> uh, quick question, Mike. Um, quite fascinated, obviously, around the traceability in your last slide um, around expiry dates. Does that mean because you've got the data embedded in the the vial that when the the clinician scans it with their uh, um, with the app that, that it would then say to them this is expired or not or is there a requirement a bit like with clinical trials where we would do something like an expiry date extension um, so it could be that we're authorized to do something where it goes out with another three month shelf life. It's just understanding that, that process. Is it all purely electronic and automatic or is there like a manual print type process somewhere in the supply chain? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Now, basically, we, there is no um, manual interaction with it. However, once we build up longer shelf life, the three months can be extended, for example, to five months, we can simply, in our SAP system, we can change it. And at that time, when it's read out at that time, it shows the five months shelf life, not the three months. So there is a flexibility mm -hmm. in it. That's correct. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you all. That concludes the presentation for today. It is time to move on to the Q&A. So we will answer the questions from the audience. Okay, so let's see our first question uh, to Michael. Okay, Agro had 200 pallet positions at minus 60 degrees Celsius storage in Netherlands for food purposes. Is minus 65 degrees Celsius a hard demand or is minus 60 doable for storage? Otherwise, we will need to focus on conversation conversion urge over the facility. Okay, uh, let, me, let me take the one. Thank you, um, thank you, Umut, for, for that question. I think whilst there's a lot of similarities in quality standards um, in storing frozen food and pharmaceuticals, um, obviously, as you know, it's an absolute no-no that you, you can mix. So if you want to store pharmaceuticals, uh, first of all, you need a license from, from the country you're operating, in this case, the Netherlands, then you need to be qualified as GMP, good manufacturing process, and that requires a certain standard. Um, if you can meet those and if you can segregate the storage between food and pharmaceuticals, um, then it could be doable. But it is, it is quite a, a way to go. You can't just automatically put pharmaceuticals in where you've stored food. As is um, you know, the question whether 60 minus 60 or minus 65, that will be up to the pharmaceutical company to, um, to decide on. Um, I guess any other panelists, to, would you like to add something there? I would um, totally agree with what uh, Michael said. Um, 
we sometimes have the same challenges within um, DHL um, where we could have a facility and then convert it. But as Michael said, uh, the first thing is you've got to get it licensed. And in some countries that can take months or years. So that's not to put off um, the guys who've asked the question. It is um, doable, but most drug regulators do not like, as Michael said, food and um, or other products which could cross-contaminate the vaccines being co-located. But it's definitely doable. Um, and that's that type of innovative thinking that we need. As Mike had said earlier, he, need, he may need additional deep frozen storage. Um, so one thing we can do, some of the suppliers, like I mentioned, Dawson's, have shipped their units around the world. So if we do have countries where they don't have these kitted reefers, then one thing is these things can be moved, a bit like a reefer, because they're just maybe slightly wider than a standard reefer, but those solutions can be done. But yeah, totally agree. Thank you. We have another question um, from the audience to Mike Slapen, asking about the feasibility for local manufacturing in developing countries. So Mike, uh, what are your thoughts on this? Mike yeah. Slapen? I see in the question indeed that it's, um, it, it's challenging. Um, we do have in, in many countries, also in Asia, we have good connections with local manufacturers. And if you do have enough time, you can develop that. Um, for a vaccine like this, which we are in a rush, um, and it's not so much about sharing our information, but it's much more um, that we, the technology um, is there. Um, filling one file of a certain vaccine or another vaccine, it's not all the same. So indeed, um, bringing um, a company up to speed for this takes time. It takes about two to three years for, for sure. So that's our challenge with um, starting local manufacturing. And we are at the moment, we are more aiming to have a selected number of global manufacturers who can have high output and um, push it to the market like this. Nevertheless, we are for the long term, we are in it to discuss with local manufacturers. Okay, thank you, Mike. Okay, we have another question um, to Mike Mikin. Okay, um, it's about limited data sharing and low quality data within the industry. So is this your experience too, Mike Mikin? If so, what could be done to improve the data management? Yeah, it's a good question. I did see, um, a number of uh, questions around uh, GXP and data integrity. Um, I mean, this uh, does follow uh, regulatory requirements, a bit like the question earlier around um, putting uh, vaccines into a food freezer. Um, it's the same with managing data and systems needing to be um, validated. I could see there were a number of questions on the same uh, subject. And um, one of the things around uh, big data and having that information being uh, interoperable, uh, interoperable is um, that um, um, I think um, there are a lot of solutions out there, especially as we become more digital, um, but they tend to be perhaps operating in silos. So for instance, one of the things I mentioned uh, was the use of gateways with uh, Bluetooth loggers. Quite standard, a lot of people will use uh, ways of being able to collect and manage data. And by doing that, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, if there is a Wi-Fi connection, you can pick up that information in uh, real time. It can be validated, it can be secure. So there's that type of um, process. The other thing, uh, you might see in my, my particular slides, we've got a solution which we've called iNibu, and we're trying to use mobile apps in a secure way of um, having an, uh, a secure way of interfacing. But there are regulatory standards. I have been working 
with GS1 with clinical trial standards for managing data and how that can be used through EDI or other processes. Um, so it is a real complex um, subject, um, but there are different solutions. And I think um, the questioner did sort of raise the MHRA has some good guidance on the subject. GS1 has some good guidance on the subject um, and they may be good places to start. Okay, thank you, Mike Mikin. We have another question um, from Craig. So I think this question is to Richard. How will you all manage the current issues surrounding a scarcity of ocean containers and reduce the belly hold availability due to globally reduced passenger air traffic. So Richard or Mike Mikin, who would you like to go first? <laughs> so ocean travel, uh, ocean shipments um, generally obviously are weeks as opposed to hours. Um, and a passive unit will have a limited amount of power within it. However, um, again, these can be used um, within the reefers um, and we do a lot where they are actually placed inside reefers so when there are power outages when it gets to the ports or when it gets to uh, being transferred the KTM will come in and hold the temperature during that transition period and it gives safety particularly to those um, highly expensive products that you don't want and can't have go out of temperature so it gives more of a stable environment for the product. If, yeah, if I, if, sorry, Michael. Sorry, Mike. Yeah. If, if I could just chime in, Craig, I, I just, I just uh, actually sent you a message. I think on, on terms of the air airlift, um, obviously the the passenger aircraft are being used as freighters, um, and many countries are, are, you know, assisting with air force and military aircraft. So I think it's really all hands to the pump, and you know, we we got to remember that the vaccines won't all come gushing out at once. There, there is a production cycle that's going to take months and months to ramp up. So I think the industry, uh, both logistics and airlines, have um, time to, to get ready for this. Thank you. OK, anyone else to add? OK, we will move on to the next question uh, from Headley List to Mike's point, Mike Mickens' point on thawing from minus 70 degrees Celsius to uh, 2 to 8 degrees Celsius and the various operations needed to get to the patient dose. How is UK NHS dealing with GMDP obligations? Yeah, if we're talking the Pfizer product at the moment, my understanding is um, um, in the UK, some of the products are actually being shipped direct from European hubs. So um, in some cases, as has been mentioned, there will be local manufacture, um, like we gave the example in Australia, with the AstraZeneca product. My understanding it will be probably manufactured around Melbourne and then uh, distributed throughout Australia. In the UK, at the moment, a lot of the manufacturing, about 80% of make, might be able to correct me here, it's amazing historically how many vaccines globally are manufactured around Belgium and the South Netherlands. Whether that be GSK, Janssen, virtually all of the world's vaccines come out of that area. And there are supply chains, uh, historic established for then distributing those into places like the UK. Now there might be a separate question on Brexit, what might happen in a month's time, whether things could change. But at the moment, it is easy to ship something direct from Brussels or Amsterdam to the UK. And when those products arrive in the hospital, they've got, um, or wherever the vaccination centre is, they've got clear instructions how to hold those products for five days as they've then been thawed, and then they will have a protocol on how to dispense that vaccine. I mean, I don't know if anybody else wants to chip in. Okay. So I will go on to the next question. Okay, Gray will be, okay. 
Great webinar today, and thanks to all the panel. It is interesting to hear about the innovations that have happened so far this year and wonder about any future innovations that may be in the pipeline that we haven't heard of, especially interested in cold chain stories. Who will take the question? Maybe if, if I may, if I may just um, maybe throw something out there. I mean, I, I think, uh, Mike, what we saw from J and J's innovative approach, having an app which can prove the authentication of of a vial. I mean, this is this is fantastic, and quite frankly, we should be doing that with all of the vaccines and all the pharmaceuticals that we buy uh, over the counter. Um, if we can somehow connect that to temperature control. So if, if, if we look at the, the, all of the data that we're, that we're taking when, we, when the, 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 the vials leave the factory, go through the whole supply chain, ends up at the hospital, um, we're checking the authentication of the vaccine using that app. But can we also add in data that we've collected along the way, that it hasn't been tampered with, that it's been kept at the right temperature, um, a history, a timestamp? Because... The technology is there. We, we have temperature monitors, whether they're passive or live, Bluetooth, whatever. Can we combine somehow that all that information together, which authenticates not only the, you know, the, the vaccine, but also gives a, a, a timestamp, a history um, to prove where it's been. And, and I, I think if we can come up with that as an industry, that's going to be revolutionary. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I would like to just add to what Michael said and just picking up on that. There is a lot of development in the GS1 world um, in the space of the, the digital link to be able to add that. The other thing to close the loop, which is very important here, is for the person giving the vaccine equally to capture that information because there have been, um, you could say, scandals in the past in some countries. Um, we were aware of what happened with a number of vaccines in Indonesia for childhood vaccines and some of the problems where fakes managed to get into the supply chain. There have been some countries where they, they issued the polio vaccine and they lost records on who got the vaccine. And if you ever have to do things like link patient information to the supply chain, that's something. But the good thing is, with the technology we've just seen, it'd be really good to then be able to use the data to scan the patient's information with the actual vial that was injected into them. And then you've got, you know, end-to-end -end full traceability. That's a big one for me. And one other I'd throw in there are robotics. We're using a lot more robots in log logistics. And maybe you being able to send robots where you couldn't send humans could be something which could get very, very interesting. And also robots help you even more with uh, digitalization. Okay, thank you. Because of the time limit, maybe this will be the last question to all the panel. Okay, so how can we work together to mitigate cold chain logistics risk? So Mike Slavin, are you going to go first? Um. Yeah, that's indeed a very good question. As long as we are um, can control it within our company, we are all okay, right? Also, the innovative solution I presented was doable because it's within one company. If more players come in, we need coordination. And that's where indeed the complexity comes in. But also, that's where we have the biggest gain to make. I think it was Michael who said, "From we don't want to just know until the warehouse. We want to know what's going beyond it. Um, that's a complexity indeed, which um, I think can be managed. Um, it's just that uh, we need a coordination here and we need, I think, one owner of this. Um, maybe, Michael, you have an idea about it? You, you, you're right, Mike. I mean, I think in the end, we're talking about big data. And, and the, the, the wonderful thing about connectivity is we do get to see visibility, not just on, on the on the, the, the history of the vaccines, but also we can open it up to give more control to the patients where they can make sure that they're, they're receiving the right. And also for feedback, it's very important that the pharmaceutical companies now, because this is such a young vaccine, continue 
we will all be an extended part of phase three trials. We, we you know, th they will be looking for participation with, with patients um, to get feedback on, on side effects or how they feel after the vaccines. And now, of course, all of that data, highly confidential, highly sensitive um, in, in a world where you may have some people who want the vaccine, some people who don't want the vaccine. So all of this has to be kept very, very private. And I think, so whilst there's a lot of benefit of having this, this connectivity and big data, um, I don't think we can have one ono. It needs to be highly regulated and it also needs to be highly protected from a patient's point of view. But uh, yes, we have to find a way where we can, where we can get that connectivity. Thank you. Michael McKean, do you have anything uh, additional to say? In, um, one thing that has cropped up on risk um, recently has been with the group that's on this panel, um, where we've got manufacturers, suppliers. Um, we used to work in, in this sort of environment, but there's a new player in town with the COVID vaccine, and that is some of the governments, the public entities, and they're finding this new, a new territory. And one thing that's cropping up that can be a challenge on risk is insurance and what, what needs to be insured, how that's paid. It's just another interesting area that I've seen sort of crop, crop, you know, sort of crop up. Thank you. Richard? Yeah, I think the thing I, I, I would suggest predominantly is the fact that if you think five months ago, we didn't have any of the products we do now. Um, and it was only because we were asked, can we do this, that we then sat down and, and worked out a, a solution to the problem. Um, and what I would ask people to do is come with the problem, not come with a, a pretty fine solution themselves. Um, we make boxes, that's what we do, and they work well. And if people actually tell us what they want to do, then we can invariably answer those questions. Thank you, everybody. Now we have come to the end of the webinar. I'd like to thank the panel for sharing your valuable time and experiences. It has been a very encouraging discussion. And also many thanks to the audience for participating today and making the webinar a success. See you all again next time and stay safe. Goodbye.